Gary, Twizzard Gorilla. Today we'll be using this pretty nifty bit of kit to find out the mass per unit length of this string by only observing the frequency. So here we have said string, some mass at the ends just to hold it down and keep it in place. Here we have a signal generator and a vibration generator connected to the former. And just, in, just so that we can be very clear what this is giving out, we've hooked it up to an oscilloscope so we can measure the frequency fairly accurately. We will need two very important equations. The first is this. The velocity of a wave in a medium, our medium here, is the string. So this is the velocity. This is our frequency. And this is our wavelength. We will look into later how to deduce what the wavelength is of this. The second most important equation of today is one that relates the tension on the string and the mass per unit length of this string with the velocity of the wavelength travelling across it squared. So to begin with we have our fundamental frequency on the string, two notes and our antinode in the middle which is the big wobble which you should be able to see. And on the right hand side here we have the signal generator which is currently outputting at 10 hertz about 10 hertz to the vibration generator and to check it here we have everything else connected up to this oscilloscope and the time base is at 10 milliseconds so that's 10 milliseconds per square and if this would stop moving we can always hope we have half a wavelength between here and here which is one two three four five so a whole wavelength would be 10 squares that's 10 times 10 milliseconds it's 100 milliseconds so the time period for our wavelength is 100 milliseconds. So our frequency is 1 over that, which is 10 hertz. Fantastic. Just like the speed of sound is constant through the air, the speed of sound through the string, i.e. the vibrations, is also constant. So looking back at this equation here, we have the speed of the wave is proportional to the frequency and is also proportional to the wavelength. Is this, if the, as this is constant, if we increase frequency, the wavelength as a direct result will decrease and vice versa. With this in mind, we are going to find out our mass per unit length by experimentally observing these two. Okay, so this in, in this particular experiment, our frequency is going to be our independent variable. And like I said before, because the speed of the wave moving remains constant, our wavelength is going to change as a result of us varying the frequency. But more on that later. We're now going to manipulate these two equations together to give us something nice to draw a graph against. So here we go. We have a, a v squared here and a v expression for v here. So if we square this expression we should be able to substitute in quite nicely. Here we go. Step one. Now I can substitute v squared in to this equation here. I've also swapped it round for convenience. So now let's tidy this up. First we'll square root both sides. And now, so we're able to plot a graph to help us get our mass per unit length, we'll just rearrange it so it's in a y equals mx configuration. We could do that first by moving the lambda over and this term here over to this side. So I'll divide the lambda. This is now our y term. Equals. Move this over to the other side. Be careful with our maths. This is our gradient. And finally, 
our f stays roughly where it is as our x term. So we're plotting y against x, in this case 1 over lambda against frequency. We'll get this as our gradient to our graph. And by doing a quick measurement of what tension is on our string, we can find out the mass per unit length. So here's a results table I made earlier. As I mentioned in the little bit of maths I did, um, we want to find, we want to measure our frequency as our independent variable, x, and 1 over lambda, which is our y variable, which will allow us to draw our graph. So I've set up my results table into three columns, allowing me to record the frequency, the wavelength, lambda, and then whilst I'm doing all that, I can start converting to 1 over lambda, ready for my graph later. So I've just taken my first set of readings, our frequency was 10 hertz. We've got our units there, good. And I've measured the length of the string, taking care to make sure I only measure from one node to the next node. That was 1 meter 35. But of course, as we've only got two nodes and one antinode, that's only half a wavelength, so we need to remember to double it. So our wavelength is actually 2 meters 0 0.70. Now we've got our first set of measurements, I'm going to adjust the setup so we find our next set of measurements. In this case it would be the first harmonic, so this is our fundamental, zero. Our first harmonic, we'll have an extra node, so here we have two, we're looking for three, and to do that I will, I will adjust our frequency. Central node here, and the last node here, two anti nodes, and thus a full wavelength. So now I'm going to take my frequency reading, and that would be from one peak to another peak, or in this case, from one trough to another trough. I've got my time base still set at 10 milliseconds, so I know each square is 10 milliseconds. So we'll start from here. One, two, three, four, five squares. And as we know that's over a whole wavelength, we know our wavelength is 50 milliseconds long, time period, I should say. So we've just measured our time period of our wavelength, and that's 50 milliseconds, that's 0 0.05 seconds. So to get our frequency, we just inverse it, and that's 20 hertz. So after all that hard work, we finally have our results table ready. Here it is. If you can look closely enough, you can see that there is a pattern in the frequency domain. However, there are a couple of slip-ups here. Maybe some ethereal forces came into being at our 66.6 hertz frequency, but we won't talk much more about that. And as you can see, I've already filled in my last column to make it easier for me to draw the graph. As we can see from our graph here, lovingly produced by Mr. Betts himself, 
we have a nice linear trend. Whoops, there we go. Which is exactly what we were expecting from our little bit of maths earlier. So, now we've fitted our line of best fit, I'm going to go ahead and find out the gradient. So now I've drawn up a nice big triangle on my graph to work out the gradient. We have 3.08 on the y-axis and 90 on the x. And that roughly is about 77 over 2,215. That sounds about right. I'll just put that into my calculator. We have a gradient of 0 0.0342. Fantastic. Bringing this back to our equation from before, which is now rearranged in our y plus mx form, as we worked out earlier. We know that our gradient is 0 0.0342, and this is equal to the m part of our equation. Now, we worked out the tension for our string earlier to be about 1 newton. In fact, it's exactly 1 newton, which makes the maths very easy. So we'll do a quick bit of rearranging of this equation to find out what our value for the mass per unit length. Here we go. Now we have this. We can substitute in our numbers. Our A here is just shorthand for our gradient. Mu equals 1 times 0 0.04, oh, 0 0.0342 squared. Working that out in our calculator. Gives us the mass per unit length of 1.17 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. Per meter. Now let's check that against the book value. So here we are with our calculated value from our gradient of the mass per unit length of our string. We've calculated it to be 1.169 grams per meter. And unfortunately, when measuring the actual string, this is a meter of string here, we have a value of 1.59 gram for a meter. And why do we think that is? I believe it's something to do with our assumptions of the tension on the string. So we had one newton of mass pulling down on the string. However, that might not necessarily translate to tension horizontally on the string for our setup.